So what happened to me is it actually started out as a freak accident. Um, at age 56 years old, I had gone to the hospital to have some bone spurs removed from my neck from sports injuries when I was younger. And it's, it's typically a, a, a very simple surgery. They've, they've now, instead of cutting the back of your neck open, they go in through the front. It's called a foraminal anatomy. They move your esophagus aside and they go in and they drill these spurs out. And you only stay in the hospital one night. So I had that surgery done. And in retrospect now, of course, this is my my transplant team telling me this, but um, I threw a blood clot three days later. So at 11 o'clock at night, I'm laying in my bed. All of a sudden, I start screaming in pain. My wife doesn't know what's going on. We have a special needs child, my only daughter, who has Rett syndrome. It comes with a seizure disorder. So we're used to hearing her scream in the middle of the night and run into her room and, and get her calmed down. But so my wife is confused. She's running around and she hears all this screaming. It's me flopping around in the bed. She finally figures that out, calls the ambulance. Thank goodness um, the hospital's only three miles from my house in North Carolina. And they rush me into the hospital. And they know that on the way that I'm having a massive heart attack. Of course, I passed out from the pain. I have no idea what's going on. So I'm rushed into the ER. They give, they give me some blood thinners, some medicines. My wife tells me to stabilize me. And they put me in a room with a nurse and my wife. And the nurse says, okay, we've called the cardiologist. He's not in the hospital. It's like 11 o'clock at night. He's in route, but he should be fine. So the next thing we know, I come off the gurney almost as if somebody had grabbed me by my lapel and pulled me forward with great force. And I spring forward off the gurney and my eyes pop open and I shout out the name Frosty. I shout out the name Frosty and I collapse backwards onto the gurney and I flatline. Code blue rings out through the hospital and in rush a team of doctors. And before they escort my wife out the door, my wife grabs this Dr. Patel, you have to save my husband's life. We have a special needs child. He, she cannot make it without him and I can't do this alone. So they take my wife out of the room and they begin to work on me. So Dr. Patel and her team work on me and they cannot revive me. So 20 minutes pass. They do everything that you could possibly imagine. I had four injections into my heart of epinephrine, um, vigorous sternal rubs, paddle shocks, everything they can possibly do. So they're about to call it because about this time now, of course, they think I'm brain dead, but something possesses Dr. Patel to keep pushing and keep working on me and keep working on me. And it's kind of interesting. So she keeps working on me. She obtains a slight pulse. At that time, the cardiologist comes in. He puts a, um, a cath through my groin. They find the, the blockage, which I had. The blood clot went right into my widow maker, puts in two stints, but it was too late. I went into cardiogenic shock and they intubated me and I slipped into a four-day coma. So what's interesting is uh, I was raised Catholic. My brother calls the local parish priest. The parish priest comes in and anoints me. And in, in the Catholic faith, it's called extreme unction. You only get that one time in your life. So extreme unction, they come in. It's a big ritual, anoint you with oils and prepare your soul to meet the Lord. So during this four-day period, uh, several neurologists come into the room. They try to test me to see if I'm brain dead. They really don't know. And on the fourth day, my doctor tells my wife, look, we're going to have to take out the tubes. If he breathes on his own, he's probably going to be a vegetable. We'll see what we have. So they start to take out the tubes and I start choking and obviously I survived. But um, I immediately went into recovery. Don't remember any of that. And it was kind of curious because my wife was the first one to, to come into the room on the first day after coma. And she approaches the bed and I tell her, you have to believe me. It was your brother, Frosty. Your Frosty came to me. And she said, I, I was talking in this childish, high-pitched voice. And she said, tell me exactly what Frosty said to you. And he said, tell my family I'm in a good place. And I need to send you back to help 
clean things up because I made a big mess of things. And she said, oh, my God, that's exactly what Frosty would have said. That was his nickname. Frosty was always making a big mess of things. So to give you the backstory, seven weeks prior, my brother-in-law, who was going through a divorce, and uh, he was about my age, actually, had a drug addiction problem in the past, but he was clean for like five years. And he decided that night, it was Christmas, he had one daughter in college, a lot of things were going on with his business, he was a landscaper. And he decided to go bluff some steam, got some really nasty street drugs and just went crazy for 10, 15 minutes. And, and he came home and, and took his own life. He passed by suicide. So Frosty was the first one to come to me and really kind of open my eyes as to there was something else going on here. Because being raised Catholic in that tradition back in the day, now I understand they've changed that, but passing by suicide was a mortal sin. And I thought to myself, how can, how can uh, he be in a good place if he went to hell, right? So that was the first thing that really started this paradigm shift in my belief system that something else was going on here. On the second day coming out of coma, which was quite interesting, Dr. Patel comes in. Of course, I've never seen this woman before, a beautiful little Indian woman. Now, I remember when she came and she sat down beside me, uh, my arms were paralyzed. I couldn't move my arms. And she had these tiny little hands, and she tells me that she was the one that was working on me. And she started to cry, and she started to tell me, you know, what she did and how many times she almost lost me and, um, and how good it was to see me alive. And I remember thinking, my goodness, how did she work on me with those tiny little hands, tiny little hands pressing on my chest? And then it got personal, got deeply personal with her. And I knew that something else had happened when I had gone into that coma and when she was working on me, but I really couldn't piece it together. And as she told her story, the puzzle kind of unscrambled because Dr. Patel said to me, you know, um, before I had my first child, my father and I were incredibly close. He helped me get through medical school. She said, we had this incredible spiritual relationship that we knew what each other was thinking all the time. And I was so close to him. We had this great spiritual relationship. But six months before my child was born, he had an aneurysm and died unexpectedly. And she said, you know, I've become very bitter. I've lost my faith. I don't, I don't believe in this anymore. Uh, and she said, but, you know, seeing you alive today just gives me a little bit of hope that maybe something, something else is out there. And then it hit me. While she was working on me, a male spirit had entered the room and kept on repeating the same thing. Keep working on him. Don't give up. You can save him. Keep working on him. You can save him. And it hit me in that moment. It was Dr. Patel's father had entered the room and was speaking through me. So she really, she didn't understand what was going on at the time. She didn't understand why she was so possessed to keep working on me. So I, I what, didn't want to tell her that in the, in the moment, you know, because here I am paralyzed and she's going to think, well, you know, the guy just came out of his thing. He was on drugs. And so I actually didn't tell her until a year later when I came back to the hospital after my transplant and sat down with her and we had a beautiful conversation. And now we're best friends and on her father's birthday every year, we talk and things like that because then her whole belief system changed. She got her spirituality back and she began to understand that her father really never left her. He's always there with her, supporting her.